Galatians. It's an incredible book. Uh, they call it the, the Little Romans. It's basically a lot of Paul's theology. Uh, and it's, it, it's very much like the book of Romans, but not as deep, not as thorough as the book of Romans. Uh, Paul is writing to the Galatians. Now, the Galatians are a group of people uh, that really came out of a Celtic background. Uh, they're a unique group of people. And they have come to Christ. They've come to know the Lord and believe in the Lord and love the Lord. And they started out as a real strong body of believers. And the Galatia area is a region of many different cities. But what's happening is they have turned to... I'll let you get that. Yeah. You got it? Okay. Everybody got their phones off? Okay. What was I teaching about? I forgot. Oh, yeah, Galatians. Yeah, those phones really throw me off. Well, oh, yeah, Galatians, yeah. All right, everybody got their phone off, right? Okay. We good to go? Great. All right. Now, I do, gotta, I do have to tell you this. If you do come here with a phone and it rings, I will make a big scene out of it. Just so you know. I'm not picking on you. I just do that. So that the next time you come to church, you go, oh, turn my phone off. Okay. Wow. How do I get back into this? So Galatians. So he's preaching to these people that have started well, and now they've turned to following the law. The do's and the don'ts and the, the you know, the, that bondage of religion. The bondage of uh, trying to think you can, you can do things to make uh, yourself right with the Lord. That you can appease the Lord with your good deeds. Really, the only thing that pleases the Lord is your love for him. And the only thing that pleases the Lord is your recognition of knowing that it's all about what Christ did for you, not what you can do for you. You can't do one single thing to, to better yourself. All your goodness comes from Jesus. It's what he does in and through you. It's what he does for you. See, if you've been to coming to Club Zion for any length of time, you know that the sign says it's all about Jesus. The sign in the back says it's all about Jesus. Our bulletins say it's all about Jesus. Our, our business cards say it's all about Jesus. Our website says it's all about Jesus. And our Facebook page says it's all about Jesus. Do you know why it says it's all about Jesus? Because it's all about Jesus. So the Galatians had gotten off track in thinking it was Jesus and something. It's Jesus. Not the good that I have done, but Christ in me. I must decrease, he must increase. I'm not saying that we shouldn't strive to be like Jesus. We should. But I can't burn enough incense I can't say enough prayers. I can't ring enough bells. I can't dress in enough clothes to make myself pleasing to God. You know why? Because God is already pleased with me because he sees Jesus in me. He's, God is pleased with Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. And that's what we're going to see in the book of Galatians, how Paul really lays this out. We're going to do some cross-referencing going to Romans as well. And probably we're going to visit Corinthians also to see how Paul puts this together. Paul is a unique writer in, in how the Holy Spirit has used his, his incredible knowledge of the word. See, Paul was a theologian. Paul was taught by one of the greatest teachers of his day. 
He knew the Old Testament inside and out. Pretty much could quote the whole thing. And how the Holy Spirit in Christ used his talent, his skills, his knowledge, and put together some of the finest writings that the Bible has to offer. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. And the anointing that's on his pages is incredible. We're going to visit that through this study. Uh, I hope you see this study through because, man, it'll straighten out your theology. I can't tell you how many Christians have warped theology, but Paul puts it straight. There are churches today still in our modern day with the knowledge we have, with the resources we have in theology. You know, you can go on the Internet and you can really study the Bible. There's such great Bible uh, programs and and websites you can go to with tremendous uh, commentaries and all that stuff. And we have no excuse to be off track. But there are churches today that still want to have a church called a Christian church, but they wrap it in the law, the do's, the don'ts. Even to the point where their deacons and elders track you down and ask you why you were doing this and why weren't you here and why didn't you come to church and why aren't you this and why aren't you that? And they hold down that, that hand of weight that Jesus died for to lift us up. So we're going to study this. And as we get into this, this study, I'm going to bring out the, we're going to see the key theme of the book, the letter. You know what a key does? What does a key do? It unlocks things, right? It unlocks things. So when you're doing a study, you want to see what is the key theme to this letter? What is the key word to this letter? How do I, what is it that's going to just open up the treasure of this book? And the key phrase or the key theme for this, this uh, study that we're going to do is Christian liberty in the grace of God. Christian liberty in the grace of God. And we're going to see that in chapters 1 and chapter 2. That's going to be revealed to us. What is the key verse in this Galatian study? It's in chapter 5, verse 1. Let me read it to you. First, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Okay, so there's your key verse. And, and the, the verse, whenever you pick a verse and, it's, and you say this is the key verse, that verse has to unlock the whole text. That's the verse. It has to put the whole thing in a nutshell. So let me read it again. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Wow. Just think about that. Christ has made us free. Now, we're going to learn what that freedom means. That freedom he gave us does not mean that we have the freedom to just do what we please. It means that we have the freedom to do as he please. We are free because, see, the the, the sinful nature has been crucified with Christ. We are buried with Christ. We are raised in a new life. And that new life that we're raised in has set us free from the bondage of sin and death. And so now we have the freedom to do as Christ pleases. We don't have the, the, the chains of sin that holds us back from that freedom. So stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Again. So he's implying that these Galatians had once been entangled by a yoke of bondage. What is a yoke? Well, in Paul's day, they were familiar with what a yoke was. Uh, when you got two oxen, and you yoke them together, uh, they, and, and I, see, I saw this when I was in Nicaragua, um, they, they still use oxen to do their, their uh, 
fields and stuff to, to drag their plows. And you'd see one oxen would be strong and powerful, and there would be another oxen next to him a little, little smaller. And what they would do is they would yoke the, the younger oxen to the, the mature oxen that knows the way. That, like the, the farmer just has a stick, and all he has to do is just touch the oxen and he'll turn. Touch the other side of him, he'll turn. But the younger oxen won't do anything. You could whip it to death, it won't do anything. So they yoke them together, and what happens is the, 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 the mature oxen drags that younger oxen everywhere the farmer wants to go. And when you see them going down the road, it's quite a sight. You see the big oxen, and he's just going down the road. And then you see the smaller oxen just leaning into him as hard as he could, trying to fight against him. And it's quite a sight. And the reason it's quite a sight is because when you know the scriptures and how Paul talks about this yoke, you understand. Because the, these, these Galatians have entangled themselves again to what? The yoke of bondage. So here is bondage just chairing down the road, and these poor Galatians are yoked to this bondage. And he says, you Galatians have yoked yourselves to the bondage to bondage. Why have you done this? Well, we're going to get into more detail with that, and I don't want to give it all away right now. Um, chapters 1 and 2. And I'm going to cover a couple of the chapters here. We're going to go through this, the book real quickly. You can write this down, chapters 1 and 2. It talks about personal grace and the gospel. Personal grace and the gospel. That's what we're going to be covering going through chapters 1 and 2. Um, in, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, we, Paul gets into grace declared in Paul's message. So uh, 1 through 10, grace is declared in Paul's message. Paul is really good at grace to you and peace from our Lord God and or to God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you. Paul always is telling his recipients, grace to you, grace to you. Grace is a beautiful thing. We cannot function as Christians without grace. We can't get saved without grace. Grace is an amazing... The, grace is also called gift. You could... Grace equals gift. Now, the word grace in the Greek is karos. So karos, uh, this grace, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. Grace is the power and the desire to do God's will. That's what grace is. Grace is the power and the desire to do God's will. You're saved by grace. Think about that. Romans says that you are saved by grace. Wow. So God imparts grace to you, a sinner. So your faith activates grace. And grace is the power and the desire to do God's will. What happens when you get saved? You have the power and the desire to do God's will. Right? When you get saved, you want to do God's will. And then you have the power to do it. Now, it says also that where, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Have you heard that? It's in the Bible. It says where, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Now, where, now, why does grace abound when sin abounds? Because when we, when, when we are in sin, God imparts to us the power and the desire to do his will, not to sin. So if we're sinning, the Holy Spirit shows up with the power and the desire to do God's will. Do you see how we need grace always? You need grace to get saved, and you need grace to continue as you're saved. Grace is the greatest tool given to a Christian. It's a beautiful thing. 
And so we're going to see how Paul addresses grace in chapters 1 and 2. He talks about grace and he talks about the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news. That's what gospel means. Gospel equals good news. What is the good news? What is the good news? The good news is you're saved by grace. The good news, you're saved by grace. The good news is Jesus died for your sin. The good news is Jesus forgave you of your sin. The good news is Jesus lives inside of you. The good news is Jesus is going to take you home to live with him in heaven. That's the gospel, the good news. And then uh, as we get into Galatians, Paul really explains the gospel. We're going to lay it out. It's beautiful. So uh, verses 1 through 10, Paul, uh, grace de is declared in, in Paul's message. And then chapter 1, verse 11 through 24, grace demonstrated in Paul's life. So as we get into this, we're going to see in chapter 1, through verse 11 through 24, we're going to see grace demonstrated in Paul's life. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, we're going to see grace defended in Paul's ministry. Grace defended in Paul's ministry. Guys, grace is wonderful. Grace is wonderful. Wow. And, and, you know, I can't emphasize enough how wonderful this grace is. We can't live a Christian life without it. You cannot live a Christian life without grace. It's impossible. You need the power and the desire to do God's will. You have to have it. God is good. And he gives us everything we need. There's nothing he doesn't want to give us. We need wisdom, he'll give it to us. He, we need counseling, he'll give it to us. We need peace, he'll give it to us. We, we need comfort, he gives it to us. Whatever we need, he gives it. And he pours it all out through grace. And the beautiful thing about God pouring out grace in every situation we need, it's done through the, his glory. What is his glory? It's the total sum of all that he is. That's God's glory. The, to the sum total of all that God is, is his glory. Oh boy, when you put this all in the pieces that it belongs in, when you look at this study, how beautiful it's going to be, you're going to walk out of here after this Galatians study going, wow, wow, I can't believe I'm a Christian. I can't believe God saved me. I can't believe I'm walking in grace. Grace is good. So we move on to chapter 3 and 4. Now, I don't think just because we're doing an overview tonight, you're done with the book of Galatians. We haven't even got into the nuts and bolts yet. All I'm doing is I'm just showing you the, the uh, what do they call that, the... Uh, What's the, what's the front w window of a department store where they have the models and stuff? What's that called? The display window? We're just looking at the display window. We haven't even gotten into the store yet. You haven't even tried on the clothes yet. Okay, chapters 3 and 4, doctrinal grace and the law. Doctrinal grace and the law. So he's going to unfold this grace, and he's going to unfold the law. Uh, Paul is very familiar with the law. Why? Because he was a Pharisee. He was the big hot dog. He knew the law. Inside and out, he knew all the law. And he even said he kept the law. He kept it. So, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. We're going to look at the personal argument. In chapter 3, 6 through 14, we're going to look at the spiritual argument. In chapter 3, 
verses 15 through 19, we're going to look at the logical argument. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, we're going to look at the historical argument. Chapter 4, verses 12 through 18, uh, we're going to look at the sentimental argument. And in chapter 4, verses 19 through 31, we're going to look at the allegorical uh, argument. Now, as we're going through this, are you starting to get a little bit excited about Galatians? Just, just a little bit, tiny bit excited? I, I'm already excited. Uh, you know, the thing about these Bible studies are, is once you start getting into them, it's like, wow. Like, this is my third time teaching Galatians, and I'm already pumped. Because you just, you think you had it then? Man, you've, like, wow, there's more treasure in there? Wow, I didn't catch that word. I didn't see that phrase. Wow. It's just so good. It's good. I hate to act like I'm too excited, but I can't help it. So let's look at chapter 5 and chapter 6. We're going to look at practical grace and the Christian life. Do you notice we're looking at a lot of grace? You notice, you notice these chapters have a lot of grace going on in them? Yeah. You're going to know about grace. Practical grace and the Christian life. Uh, I think we all need a, a, a schooling on Christian life. I think is very important. Your life is a living epistle. Your life. When you tell someone that you're a Christian and you go to church, guess what? They're reading you. You're the epistle they're reading. You, you're, the epistle, how true and how accurate is your epistle that they're reading? What is it? I forgot what it is. I think it's uh, one out of 100 people read the Bible and 99 out of 100 people read the person reading the Bible. When you tell people you're a Christian, they're watching to see if it's accurate. So the practical grace and the Christian life. In chapter 5, uh, that's going to be basically chapter 5 and chapter 6, but we'll break it down a little bit, and let's look at chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Uh, we're going to be looking at liberty, not bondage. Liberty, not bondage. Um, you don't realize it, but it's real easy for the devil to whisper in your ear, to put yourself in bondage. You can put yourself in bondage. Uh, he'll take away your liberty. And he'll accuse you day and night of how awful you are and what a failure you are and how worthless you are and how you're not able to do this and you're not able to do that and you'll never do this and you'll never measure up and you're never going to be of any use to anything. The devil's good at that. He puts you under bondage. So we're going to be looking at liberty, not bondage. In chapter 5, 13 through 26, we're going to be looking at the spirit, not the flesh. The spirit, not the flesh. Now, I've been studying the Bible for, I don't know now, I lost track of how many years. A lot of years, 30 years, I don't know, long time. Been studying the Bible. And, and I mean studying it, not, not just reading it, studying the Bible. Even when I first got saved, the first thing that happened is they put me in a Bible study. And it's like God had a plan. I've been going to church ever since I first gave my life to Jesus Christ. I've never not been going to church. I go to church. I've always gone to church, always gone to Bible study. I've gone to seminars. 
I've, got, I've done everything I could possibly do to, to get as much Jesus as I could get in there. And guess what? I'm not perfect. If you think that going to Bible study makes you perfect, you're wrong. But the enemy always will target the things we do wrong and never applaud the things we do right. So we could put ourselves in bondage. I'm not giving you permission to be a bozo uh, or myself, but no matter, you can look at Pastor Keith and say, well, well, he's perfect. No, Pastor Keith's not perfect. I'm still working at this like you're working on it. But we need to understand the Bible. That's what sets us free, understanding it. Not just reading it, studying it. So you're going to be studying this Bible. You're going to be studying this text for the next, I don't know how many weeks. So, liberty, not bondage. Spirit, not flesh. Chapter 6, 1 through 10, others, not self. Write that down. We're going to be looking at others, not self. It's not all about you. You were born into Christ for a purpose, to serve Christ and others. That's what you were born into Christ for. He brought you to himself to reach out to others. That's why he brought you to himself. He gave you a mission. Go ye therefore. He said to, to go and make disciples. You know what a disciple is? God never said go and make converts. He said go and make disciples. Go and make students that will go and make students. When you learn something, teach somebody else what you learned. I, I, I think it's critically important from a very young Christian age. My teachers were always taught me to teach. Teach what you learn. And teach only what you learn. Don't make it up in between. And what you don't know, don't invent. Teach what you know. And even as a, a baby Christian, I, I would meet with the guys at work and I'd say, hey, you guys want to do a Bible study? And i just teach them what I learned that Sunday in Sunday school. I learned that in Sunday. I'll take that little nugget and I'll bring it to, to work. Others, not self. Chapter 6, 11 through 18, God's glory, not man's praise. God's glory, not man's praise. Uh, I, I kind of laugh at churches that spend half the service praising everybody that comes to church. Well, let's, let's give a big hand for brother so-and-so. Uh, he uh, came in and did the lawn this weekend. Let's give a big hand for Sister Margaret Ann whoever, she, she played the piano today. Let's give a big hand for, and, and they spend half the service praising the people. We don't praise people. We praise Jesus. We praise Jesus that's in you, but we praise Jesus. If you notice, we don't do specials. We don't have Sister Mary Margaret come up here with a tape that she plugs into the, the soundboard and oh. No specials, no stars. It's all about Jesus. All about Jesus. These musicians on this stage, if they got ego happening, they're out of the worship band. It's all about Jesus. The ushers, if they got any, Jesus, any praise going on, they're out of the ushers. It's all about Jesus. It's got to be about Jesus. So God's glory, not man's praise. There is nothing that we could possibly do to outshine God. I don't care how good you sing. I don't care how good you teach. I don't care how good you run or sit or whatever you do. It's never going to be better than what Jesus can do. Never. So it's got to be his glory, not man's praise. So as we go through this book, you're going to see... You're just going to get the rudder real straight. You're just going to know how to run that ship right down its course. It's going to be wonderful. Now, the Galatians, they started out well. They started out really well. And, uh, and their, their Christian ex experience was by faith. 
They came to the Lord in faith. They, they grew in faith. They, they worshiped in faith. They served in faith. They started out well, well, but they crossed a fine line. And they began to trade the works of faith in for the work of the, their, the law, keeping the law. Uh, they started charting a new course based on works. And, and what Paul does in this letter, you're going to see his heart in this letter. He becomes very disturbed by this. And, and some of his language is pretty harsh. I mean, he really gets on them. It, it hurts him. And wouldn't it hurt anybody? I mean, if you got a brother or sister in Christ that you really love and you've watched them grow and you've watched them really to shine for Christ, you've really watched how God has moved in their lives and then you start to see them veer off, doesn't it break your heart? Doesn't it really break your heart to just see a strong Christian begin to veer off course? It does. It breaks your heart. And we're going to see Paul's heart and how uh, he grieves for them. Um, So Paul, in this gospel, we're going to see how he attacks their gospel of works. And then we're going to see how he defends the gospel of faith. Also in this book, you're going to see how Paul gives his credentials. Uh, The reason why Paul gives his credentials is because there are some legalistic believers that uh, don't want to listen to you if you don't have credentials. You know, I'm not going to listen to you. Who do, what do you know? What do you know? He lays out his credentials, uh, not that he brags about himself either. He counts it all as, as rubbish. But he lays out his credentials. Um, and kind of what he also lays out is how blessings come uh, from God based on faith, not the law. Blessings come from God based on faith, not by the law. The law doesn't do anything for you. What the law does is it, it, it brings guilt, condemnation. The law, it, it brings bondage. Why? Because you can't keep it. That's why it brings bondage. That's why it brings condemnation. That's why it, it brings guilt is because you can't keep the law. The Bible says if you broke one, you broke them all. So let's say that you didn't quite tell the truth. You know, you didn't bear, you kind of bore false witness. You kind of didn't tell the whole truth. Guess what? You're as evil as a murderer, according to the law. So the law can never, ever satisfy it. All it does is con- condemn, condemn, condemn. The law can, it de- declares every man and woman guilty and imprisons them. That's what the law does. Faith, what does faith do? It sets people free to enjoy the liberty of Christ. That's what faith does. It sets people free to enjoy what? The liberty of Christ. What does the law do? It brings condemnation. It brings guilt. And it brings imprisonment. Now, liberty is not a license. Liberty is not a license. To to be free doesn't mean that you have the freedom to do as you please. The the liberty that Christ gives you is you now have the freedom to produce fruit. That's what you now have. You have have freedom to produce fruit. What What is it that you are able to produce? Love, joy, peace, patience. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
you now have the freedom to produce that. Where before you didn't have the freedom to do that. You didn't have love. You didn't have joy. You didn't have peace. You had all the opposite of that. You had anxiety. You had aggravation. You had people you didn't like. There were, you, you weren't gentle. You were aggro. You were ate up. That's what faith does. It gives you the liberty and the freedom to produce fruit. When you see a strong Christian, when you, when you meet a strong Christian, someone who's really grounded in the word of God, you know what you notice about them? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what you notice about them. Why? Because they have the freedom, they have the liberty to produce fruit. Praise the Lord. So this is the, this is the outline of what we're going to be learning. This is what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. I think you'll like it. Let me get some water. Why are you all staring at me? That's the hardest part about teaching and preaching is everybody's staring at you. And you don't really know that you got food on your shirt or, you know, something in your hair. You don't know that. Okay. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not from man, men nor through man, man. Apostle, not from men, not through man. But how is he an apostle? Through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. God the Father who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's how I'm an apostle, he says. Wow, an apostle. Paul's an apostle. So he starts the letter out telling the Galatians that, hey, I'm sending this letter to you and it's coming from an apostle. What does that mean? That means you better listen. It means you better pay attention. This is coming from the higher ranks. This is come, coming from the top shelf. You better listen. And all the brethren who are with me. So Paul is sending this letter. He's saying, I'm an apostle. No man made me apostle. No men made me apostle. It is, it is God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. That's who made me an apostle. And I'm sending you a letter. And, and I'm also sending you this letter. It's not just me, but it's all these people that are with me. And pretty much who's with them? All the big, big guys, the head honchos, the strong Christians. The Christians with authority. So he, he tells them how that, hey, this is coming from a good source. This is coming from, from, from up above. This is coming from God Almighty himself. I'm writing you this letter. And then he says, but first I want to tell you grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace to you. Grace to you. Paul usually starts his letter out, his letters out like this. It's, it's a good thing to start your letter out. Have you ever, you know, wrote a letter to someone and you said, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever started your letter like that? It's not a bad way to start a letter. It's not a bad way at all. 
Why is, it, uh, why is that a good way to start a letter? Because everyone needs grace and everyone needs peace. Peace. Grace to you. And peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. Do you see how, see how Paul's already starting to lay some pretty heavy stuff right out in the beginning of the letter? And, you know, when we read these introductions to these letters, um, it's not like Paul's just rambling on. These words are important to Paul. These are essential words that need to be delivered to the recipient so that they're able to digest and receive the letter that he's sending them that's going to be pretty tough for them. He's going to be tough on them, gently tough, with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, but he's going to be tough on them. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil, this evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. That he might deliver us from this present evil age. Because it's God's will that Jesus delivers us. It's God's will that Jesus delivers us. Do we live in a present evil age today? Yes. yes. Did they live in a present evil age 50 years ago? Yes. How about 100 years ago? How about 500 years ago? Yes. How about 1,000 years ago? Yes. Has there ever been an age where it hasn't been a present evil? No. Why? Because the evil one is here. So this letter is applicable to us today. This isn't like we're just studying a time gone and past. This letter is for us as well today. We are living in a present evil age. And so God gave Jesus to us as a gift. And, the, and Christ came and gave himself to us so that God the Father and Jesus Christ himself could impart grace, which was needed in this present evil time. Verse 4 who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according, according to the will of God, our God, according to our God and Father. Well, of course, chapter 5, verse 5 should follow that. To whom be glory forever and ever and amen, right? That should definitely be there. Five should be absolutely right there under that verse. So let's put that together. Verse one, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him, Jesus, from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God and Father, our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Hmm. Then verse 6, he just gets right into it. He, he does this beautiful introduction. He reminds them of how beautiful God is. He reminds them of how wonderful the, our heavenly Savior is. He reminds them of how Jesus died for their sins. And he reminds them of how, how much they need grace and peace. And then he says in verse 6, I marvel that you turn away so soon from him who calls you in this grace of Christ 
to a different gospel? Does he hold back? Does he wait to write four pages and then get into it? No, he gets right into it. Why does he get right into it? Because it disturbs him of what they're doing. It disturbs them. If you come to Jesus Christ and you lay your life down and you surrender to him, you acknowledge that he died for your sin, you acknowledge, acknowledge that he is truly the son of God, you acknowledge that he is truly God in the flesh, you acknowledge that he is risen and he sits at the right hand of the Father, born of a virgin, you acknowledge that. It is a horror to turn away from the grace of God and to start trying to finish your race in the flesh. It's a horror. God wants, he wants so badly to guide and steer you in the plans and the direction that he's prepared for you. God said he knows the plans that he has for you. God knows the plans that he has for you. God has a plan for you. And the plans are good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. It is God who has begun a good work in you, will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Do you not know that you're not your own? You've been bought with a price? You're the temple of God? See, God wants to do this. He wants to do it. I think it's important that we surrender daily to the Lord, daily. We just daily surrender. The Bible tells us to run boldly to the throne of grace in time of need. Run boldly to the throne of grace. Isn't that wonderful that God opens the, he opens the holy of holies, he rips the veil out of the way, and there he is right before us saying, come to me, come to me. I've got everything you need. Grace is all you need. He's got it. And out of that grace comes the whole magnitude of who he is. His glory comes out of all that grace. And he says, come to me. Come to me and I will pour it out. I will give you the fullness, the total sum of who I am. I will pour it out into your life. That's what God gives to us. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. We'll get into the rest of that next Tuesday night. A different gospel. When, when your religion starts to alter the true gospel, you're in the wrong place. You've made a big mistake. If, if any church, any pastor, any preacher, any teacher begins to change the gospel, you need to run away and go get right back to that throne of grace. Get on your knees, pour your heart out to the Lord and say, God, forgive me. I want to come home. I want to come home. It's very important to never put yourself under bad teaching. It's so important. I tell you guys all the time, go home and check me out. Check me out. Make sure that I'm do teaching the right stuff. Because whether it's me or any teacher, you want to make sure that you're under good teaching. Because the last thing you need is someone to steer you in the wrong direction. And you miss out on the fullness of what just five verses has given us. And we got a long way to go. We're going to dissect this text. Father, we thank you, bless you. We thank you, Lord God, for your word. We thank you, Lord God, for each student that has come tonight to learn and, and grow in your word, Father. And help us, Lord, that we don't even bring ourselves under false teaching of our own teaching, Lord. That we will be careful to only uh, align ourselves with the truth we know. And so, Lord, uh, help us to walk in, in the simplicity 
of your grace, the simplicity of your grace. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you, you promised, Holy Spirit, that you'd guide us in all truth. So we're counting on you, Holy Spirit, to lead us in that direction. And Lord, thank you for these facilities. Thank you for our food tonight. And get, Lord, just bring us home safely. And uh, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.